Hi there, and welcome to Clinical Laboratory Medicine, the riveting topic of ear swabs. I'm Alex Alexander, and this is the voiceover PowerPoint for week two for the clinical laboratory diagnosis portion of the systems class now called naturopathic clinical diagnosis. Wow, I think I just wasted 20 minutes of my only 10 minutes saying that. So I'm trying to, I'm going to try to go really fast because we only have 10 minutes to get through this. Otherwise, I have to upload it to YouTube and you all watch the YouTube video. You know what that's like. So let's just jump right into the meat of this presentation. I'm actually only talking about uh, the clinical laboratory portion. So Dr. Acosta Smith is going to talk about signs and symptoms and all that um, pathophysiology and all that awesome stuff. And I'm going to try not to duplicate our efforts that uh, she's doing. So I'm just going to talk about the lab stuff. So if you want to know anything about lab, ask me. If you want to know anything about anything else, you can still ask me. It's okay. Otitis externa. That's a lovely picture, isn't it? That one's colonized with Staph aureus, and I realized that I switched that slide just as I said. We're getting into the meat of the presentation. Oh, so terrible. The next slide there is also externa. It's um, a nice little caption there that asks you if you'd like to culture that. So what are the causes of otitis externa? Well, we have gram-positive, gram-negative, anaerobic, fungi, and I want to stop briefly here on Aspergillus niger, 10% of all cases in the U.S., and also candida albicans. So, you know, don't discount the role of our um, fungal friends in otitis externa. Also, primary skin conditions, including atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, seborrheic derm, allergies, herpes simplex, and ugh, shingles, yuck. Painful, painful, painful. So laboratory diagnosis there, otitis externa, is diagnosed on the basis of physical examination. Symptoms include the following. Pain, pruritus, foul smelling, discharge, reduced hearing, vertigo, and difficulty with, carefully I'll say this word, mastication. Culture results will identify the causative organisms. So diagnostic testing, gram stain and culture of the discharge from the ear should be obtained to determine the cause of organism and to guide antibiotic sele selection. But if you have a patient that shows up in your world that has otitis externa, it's just good practice to do a blood glucose level so you can exclude di diabetes mellitus. And we'll cover that test in another lab. just want to plant that seed for you. And then imaging studies are also part of the diagnostic testing, the diagnostic workup for otitis externa. But if you need to refer someone for a CT for otitis externa, let me just compel you to send them to um, an otolaryngologist or someone who is a specialist. Referral would be prudent at that point. I know personally I'm not comfortable um, managing that condition. I'm not a specialist. And so if it's more than a, a simple otitis externa, then I'm going to refer it. And I suggest you do the same, at least in your initial phases of your practice. Next slide there, gram stain. So what do we do when we're, when we're gram staining? We're taking a swab of the discharge and we um, smear it onto a, um, and fix it onto a glass slide. And we stain it with crystal violet and iodine. And it's viewed under a microscope. What we don't want to see is bacteria. So the normal result is going to be a paucity of that with leukocytes per high-powered field. And um, the comments there, cell walls, bacteria stain pink or blue. It's pink or purple, according to my slide, depending on whether bacteria are gram negative or gram positive, respectively. I'm sure you all remember gram staining from micro, and you're going to do a little of that here uh, at the Bastyr Laboratory unless things have changed drastically. Results can be obtained rapidly, and that's going to allow initiation of early treatment. The truth, though, and the reality is you aren't going to do it yourself. You know, you just can't be all things to all people, so you're going to need to part yourself out a little tiny bit or part your work out as, as it is and send your swab to your local clinical laboratory. And now we're on to ear culture. Swabs of discharge from the ear plated for aerobic and anaerobic culture onto blood auger, which supports the growth of most bacteria, and we don't want to see anything growing, so normal skin flora would be a normal result. The problem with ear cultures is that the results aren't available for about three days, so you're going to have to treat presumptively if you think you're going to need an antibiotic and that's going to delay the initiation of appropriate treatment. It's not that big of a deal in an ear culture. It's more of a big deal in upper respiratory and UTIs. Previous antibiotic treatment is going to alter the results. So there would be no point in trying to grow out a culture 
um, if your patient's been on a shotgun approach for antibiotics previous to you. And we can talk more about that in our discussion. But the reality of ear culture is that you might need to culture an ear infection, particularly externa. So you should be prepared with the proper equipment if you're in a primary care role. So how do I do it? I use a moistened swab to remove debris or crust from the ear canal. And I am uh, always reminded of my um, long-term patient who has the crustiest ears in the universe. I think very fondly of her. Obtain sample by firmly rotating the swab in the outer canal. And for otitis externa, you vigorously swab this because otherwise you're going to miss strep cellulitis and you don't want to miss that. The next slide there is otitis media with a perforation. That's a beautiful picture. And what are the causes of acute otitis media? Well, it's really two things, um, two main factors. Microbial load, which is both viral and bacterial. And so uh, influenced by entities that affect the environment like siblings, attendance, and group, group daycare, history of HP, seasonal epidemics, immune response, which is influenced by factors that affect the host, such as age, genetic, pre genetic predisposition, et cetera, et cetera. In the event of an upper respiratory viral infection, the eustachian tube and the nasopharynx may become overwhelmed with congestion, and that results in impaired clearance mechanisms um, and impaired pressure regulation, a condition that may allow aspiration of pathogens into the middle ear. Um, the naturopaths, they have this, we have, they have, we all have, yay, this great technique for clearing the eustachian tube. I love it. It brings me deep joy. I'll be happy to show you that sometime. So causes of acute otitis media, strep pneumonia with the introduction of heptavalent pneumococcal vaccine, the PCV7. Now we've got more cases due to other bacteria. And although generally uncommon, strep pyogenes is still significant. Staph aureus and then respiratory viruses alone account for 30%. Concurrent viral and bacterial, bacterial infection, 15%. And you can see there the apparent low incidence of viral involvement may be a reflection of, of sensitivity and technical, technical difficulties. RSV is um, the most commonly detected virus in the middle ear fluid. I feel like I'm speed reading, but I want to get through this in 10 minutes. The causes of chronic otitis media, um, primarily it's an infectious disease. So just keep that in mind. That results from the interplay between two main factors, as we said before, microbial load and the immune response. All other factors known to cause chronic otitis media are related to those two core elements. To swab or not to swab. So we're not going to swab in chronic otitis media. It's just not recommended. And we're all about best practice here. Tympanocentesis is recommended in patients with persistent or recurrent um, AOM, and that's not acupuncture and oriental medicine. That's acute otitis media, refractory to antibiotic management, and it also fa facilitates evacuation of the middle ear effusion, which may help break that cycle of the persistent and recurrent acute otitis media. The next slide there tells you how to do a tympanocentesis, but, you know, let me compel you guys, don't even try this. Don't try it until you've been in practice a while, until you've um, been working with someone who's done it and you've had a chance to practice it. Okay, so if you're the only person and you're in the field, you know, and you're somewhere in the bush and you got a needle and you need to rupture an eardrum, then drive on. But otherwise, send the person to a specialist. More on tympanocentesis should be reserved for the complicated, recurrent, or chronic persistent patient. For an intact eardrum, clean the ear canal with soap solution, collect the fluid via your syringe, as we said before in the previous slide. And the transport time is less than two hours. There's a boring picture, but it makes a point. Ha, no pun intended. You're unlikely to do this. I wouldn't. Refer the patient. Ruptured or external ear canal swab. Now you can do that one and you can do it well. So rock that baby gently, very, very gently. And then the lab manual on ear culture. Preliminary reports. It talks about a little bit about when those are available. 24 hours, final results, five days. And then this slide tells you about specimen types, sterile containers, how much aspirate you need. This is There's a lot of information on these next three slides. The... Um, for an intact eardrum, what you need to do for a ruptured eardrum, a transport in a sterile container, and that's the inner ear. For an outer ear, use moistened swab to remove crust, obtain the sample by rotating, and then transport. And then there's a little on sample rejection because no one wants to be rejected. And in summary, we're going to say do swab external otitis, do not swab chronic otitis, do not swab acute otitis mania unless the TM is ruptured and refractory to care for 10 days. And then follow your lab procedures for collection.